I am uh, officially uh, welcoming and uh, very, very happy to, uh, to start this uh, first uh, webinar uh, in 2018. In, uh, as a French person, in the French tradition, we have the whole month of January to uh, wish, uh, you know, best wishes for the new year. So happy new year, everyone. Happy new year. <laughs> happy new year. I'm here in Brussels uh, office together with the Laura uh, Bacci. Uh, Laura Bacci is, uh, is one of our senior uh, Pluribus associates. She will uh, give us more information about the plan for 2018 regarding our communication and, and webinar activities. And then uh, we have uh, the opportunity and the chance to have uh, two women friends from Pluribus. Uh, so we have uh, Elisabeth Ozan, who is uh, English and based in Switzerland. So we have Switzerland with us. And we have Clyde de Groot, who is American and he's, sorry, she's, uh, I think, yeah, American and based in Miami, apparently Miami Beach. We need your sunshine. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Um, we've started a year ago uh, with this series of webinar uh, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Pluribus. And we, we wrote a, a collective book, Inclusion Around the Clock. So my name is Isabelle Pujol. I'm the founder and the, the director of uh, Pluribus. And really Pluribus is a global network uh, fully dedicated to support uh, individuals, teams, organizations to thrive, to, uh, you know, to grow through the uh, very important values of diversity and inclusion. And as we know, diversity and inclusion might be things totally different from a region, a country, a business. Uh, and our role is really to ensure that the diversity and inclusion values are really understood. Uh, so the reason why also of these webinars is to be able to uh, look at all these different facets. So today, the focus is going to be on um, focusing on visuals and how visuals could create more inclusion. But before, you know, uh, I, I head over to uh, um, Elisabeth and Clydette, maybe a few words from, from Laura to talk about our plans for 2018. Yes, so uh, it's very exciting because I was in the same place as Elizabeth and Claudette one year ago when we started off the webinars. Um, so it's exciting to be here again one year later and knowing that there's people from Switzerland, there's people from the US and lots of other people, around 20 people now joining uh, this webinar. And um, I just wanted to say a few things. So we're going to be very um, active in communications this year. Make sure that you go and check out our new website, which is online. And um, where it's in several languages. It's still under construction in some languages, but make sure you have a new visual, you have new images. There's lots of resources for you to be able to access. So just just so that you know um, that we have launched the new website this year. Um, we will continue doing the webinars every month. So at the end of every month, you'll have a webinar. Um, remember that you can access past webinars if you haven't been able to attend. There's all of the recordings of the webinars are on our YouTube channel. And you can get the link via our um, website and on our YouTube channel. And we will be announcing our series of webinars um, for the end of, uh, until the end of the year soon, in a few weeks time. But just know already that the next webinar, the one in February, will take place on the 28th of February. Okay? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. So the way that we're going to structure uh, this one hour together, it's very simple. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Elizabeth and, and Clydette, and they will go through some, uh, you know, context setting about what it means to use visuals. And we will go through some exercise ourselves. So it will be very interactive. Uh, for you to know, I'm currently recording the 
the, the, the webinar, as uh, Laura mentioned, because at the end, it will be also posted on our, on our website. And we have uh, the opportunity also to ask questions to uh, Elizabeth and Clydette. So you have on the bottom of the screen uh, an icon for Q's and A's. So please do not hesitate. We'll make sure that uh, by the end of the presentation and the conversation, uh, we have time for uh, answering by chat some of the questions, but also feel free to contact us at the end of the webinar for any question that you have or some, you know, ideas or suggestions. Yes, and maybe any uh, suggestions about future subjects for future webinars. Mm -hmm. So we can always talk about this at the end of this webinar. But uh, yes. first, I'm very excited to start uh, the webinar. Yes. And the thing is, as you see, the webinar or the format that we're using for this webinar is very informal. The idea is to have open conversations, get some insights, get some inspirations and, uh, and, and go with it. So very happy to hand over first to Elizabeth. Elizabeth and I have been working together uh, on a, a couple of uh, events where we were using uh, uh, the visual. So very happy first maybe for Elizabeth to give the context of uh, the, the sessions with the two of you with Clydette. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, welcome to all our participants. Uh, we're delighted to have you here on board, even if we can't see you. And we look forward to answering any questions that you have at the end of the webinar. I'd like to give special thanks to my friend and colleague, Clydette de Groot, for joining us in Miami, where it's only 8.30 a.m. in the morning, although I'm sure there are other people from around the world who are also making the same effort. But it's Clydette's support and passion that made this conversation that we're about to have possible. So thank you very much for that. And just a quick story about how Clydette and I met before we start, because it's very relevant to one of the main points that we'll be bringing up in this webinar. So uh, Clydette, I think it was in 2008 that we met, something like that, at a coaching conference in, uh, in Geneva. And we got talking about coaching and uh, conversations and visuals. And then Clydette said to me, why don't you come to this fantastic training that I'm attending? It's for graphic recording. And I said to Clydette, but you know, Clydette, I don't draw. I can't draw, you know. Um, to be perfectly honest, the only exam I ever failed was art. <laughs> this, this is a true story. You know, I, I tell lots of stories, they're usually true. And so Clydette convinced me that this was a good idea. And it was the beginning of my visual journey. And after that, after 2008, this is about 10 years now that I've become a visual practitioner using visuals, mainly with groups, but also on one-to-one -one coaching conversations. So thank you to Clydette for that. And I think Clydette had something to say to us, one or two instructions before we go on. Hello, Clydette. Okay, um, I don't seem to be having problems with communications. So we are going to ask you to take a piece of blank paper. Nobody can see you. So take a piece of blank paper, pencil, a marker. Copy anything that you see from the screens and have fun because there will be a little exercise for you later on. Remember, everyone can draw. If I can draw, everyone can draw. And in any case, nobody can see you. So absolutely nobody. Okay, so let's take a little look at uh, what we'll be exploring today. Of course, on our first slide, we have the title, which is the title actually of the article that I wrote for uh, Isabel's book, Inclusion Around the Clock. And we're calling this conversation all on the same page. And we want that to be more than just a figure of speech. Because when you use visuals, particularly with groups, they are literally on the same page. Because as you will see in some of the examples, people are working together at the same time, using markers at the same time on the same piece of paper. So it's a sort of literal uh, experience for them and also a metaphor of inclusion. And what we would like to show you today 
is how visuals can accelerate diversity and inclusion experience. So get your piece of paper ready and let's look at what we will be exploring today. So our main uh, objective is to show how visuals can accelerate inclusion. And how does that happen? It happens because words are connected to language, obviously. So they're connected to culture, they're connected to country. Whereas images are a universal language. If you draw a car, then whether you're in India or in China, you will recognize that it's a car. It might not be exactly the same, but you recognize the idea of car. The other thing that's great about visuals is that they engage the whole brain. So whether you're more a sort of linear, left brain kind of person, you need the right brain person to help you to get ideas, to be creative, and to possibly promote innovation and that sort of thing. And the other thing that Clydette, as a psychologist, will be talking a little more about later on, is that when you use images, particularly hand-drawn images, then they create an emotional connection, which a photograph or clip art cannot do. So, how are we going to be doing this? As Isabel was saying, very informal way, conversation between uh, Clydette and me, basically, because unfortunately you can't intervene uh, in real time, but we're looking forward to your questions. And we'd like to tell you some stories about our professional experience and how that works with visuals. We'll be using lots of pictures as soon as the PowerPoint uh, gets going. And because we're talking about uh, visualization, then we will be talking uh, about how to include individuals and groups and possibly give you some ideas as to how you could apply these techniques in your own context. So, uh, Clydette, if you're there, um, I think it's over to you to talk a little bit about context for using visuals. Well, we seem to be having a problem. Yeah, we, we, are, we, we are just realizing that uh, we lost Clydette. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's the, the, the challenges, I would say, of technology. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. She's not, uh, she's not uh, on the line again, despite uh, all the testing. So I don't know whether, um, Elizabeth, do you have uh, also access to the, the slide uh, deck? What? Yes, I will try to do that, although I don't know how to... Would it be helpful if I just show the slides like this? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, thank so, you. This is even better because you don't see me now. So what you should be seeing is the different contexts in which we can use visuals. Visuals can be used with individuals. So that could be one-to-one uh, -one conversations in a coaching context, for example. It can also be used um, in conversation with between two people so that they can explain better what they're talking about. People think more quickly when they're using visuals. In the third um, example, that would be more or less what I do for companies, and that's how we met Isabel, if you remember. Um, this would include sort of graphic recording, where you would have a professional facilitator who would take notes, visual notes, during your conference or seminar, and that would give you a real-time resume of what's going on, and also get people on the same page because if it's if I'm doing this kind of job then I like people to actually to participate and put their own marks on the paper and in the fourth one then it's actually getting people in groups to do collective work together and this we'll be talking a lot more about it particularly in my work because it really brings people together on a totally different level if you give them the PowerPoint presentation okay so one of the points that we were trying to make is that images are universal. And I have a question for people. Have you ever been stuck in a foreign country and not been able to express what you would like to do or where you're at or what you would like to buy or whatever? We have the solution. Because images are universal, these people from Berlin came up with this book. It's called Icons from icon and cartoons. 
And what it does, as you can see here, is give you different chapters. So you can talk about travel, you can talk about uh, your car, you can talk about what you, how you would like to travel. And one of the pages in particular is emotions. So you can just point to one of these things wherever you are in the world and say, this is how I feel about the service, or this is what I would like to do. And it's very, very easy for everybody to understand. So this is about the universality of images. Um, to come back to a more specific context of Doribus, because that's what we're here for, basically, I'd like to go back to the article that I wrote for inclusion uh, around the clock. And thank you, Isabel, for inviting me to do that, by the way. And maybe where your company is at the moment is here. Maybe your company does not include all the different categories or genders or races or whatever. That's a possibility. And you can see from the image that these little squares and pyramids are outside the main circle. What Pluribus would like to help you to do and what I would like to support Pluribus in doing by using visuals is to get you to stage two and three, which would be to get you to integration, which is a good step to begin with, but it just means that the squares and the pyramids, okay, they're inside the big circle, but they're still in their own little circle. What we would like you to get to is this, which is inclusion, where there is no difference between the squares, the circles, or the pyramids. And that's what we would like to help you do today. And because I said we were going to be telling stories, then first a story. It's borrowed from um, an author called Dan Rome, who wrote a lot about using visuals in a business context. And this is my representation of his story. So if you can see that, uh, you can see a fox in a forest. And above the forest, you can see a hummingbird. Well, I hope you can see the hummingbird. This is my drawing, so I hope it's clear. <laughs> what is the fox doing? The fox is hungry. The fox is absolutely concentrated on filling his stomach. So he's going through the forest, nose to the ground, and everything that he concentrates on is to deal with his hunger. It's getting something to eat. He's totally focused. In other words, in Dan Rome's words, he is left brain. So he's the very, it's a very linear process. It's going from A to B, and it's very goal-oriented. The hummingbird, on the other hand, is hovering over the forest, happy as anything, and he can see, or she can see, because we're in a diverse community, he or she can see the whole of the forest, can see the big picture, can see the types of trees, can see the river in the middle. And this, for Dan Rome, is an illustration of the right brain, which takes in a big picture, a bird's eye view literally, taking into consideration all the aspects and not just, I'm hungry, I want some food. So if you have these both, I mean, everybody has a left brain and a right brain. We tend to use the left brain more than the right brain, but we need both for team building, we need both for innovation, and for project management. So one or two uh, stories from my experience where we've used visuals in groups. Um, I wanted to do this. Okay, this is the first picture. I hope everybody can see that. A little bit of context about this picture. You've got people in protective clothing and it's early morning and they're all wondering what they're doing. To give you some context, it's a global supply chain from a big pharmaceutical company. And they're on a four day retreat in Barcelona. I was brought in to help do a sort of visual 101 class and explain how visuals could be useful, for example, in presentations. And they were working on their vision and values. And their main theme was what is our DNA? 120 people, five continents, so diversity in this particular context is a given. But what we're trying to work towards is inclusion. And on the last day, 120 people 
in protective clothing, wondering what they're going to do. And this is what happened. In picture number two, you can see them standing in front of a wall of paper. There's 20 meters of paper, 120 people. That means 20 groups of six people facing a 20 meter long piece of paper. So what happened then? What happened then is that we asked them to paint in pink and blue, a sort of gray filigram DNA, which was printed on this big piece of paper. And then each group had one linear meter to work on, and they could do whatever they wanted in that case. And what happened in that time? They all got to work really happily, and so you can see them working uh, very clearly here. And when they stepped back in the last photograph, there was a sort of collective wow, because they saw that they were literally on the same page. This whole exercise took 30 minutes. We never give a long time in this kind of exercise because if you do, then the left brain kicks in and starts to criticize, starts to judge, which sort of shuts the right brain down and then bye-bye creativity, bye-bye innovation. What happened with this team who came from five different continents after this experience is that the connection in terms of camaraderie, in terms of almost bonding, was more physical than if they had just continued to discuss their vision and their values. With the same objective in mind, this is a different example from a totally different group. And the objective here was also inclusion, but inclusion of onboarders. So it's a small group, around 40 people, with something like seven or eight people onboarding. So we showed them some Miro drawings, which you probably recognize over here. And the first step was for people together in small groups of three or four to start doodling, to start drawing to like any sort of squiggles or anything they felt like doing very free on the piece of paper. And then the small groups had to fill in in the same way, one linear meter of color. And one constraint was you must not put the same color next to the same color of somebody else. And that's the only constraint. Also a very short exercise. And the energy level that you get in this kind of uh, activity is, is just, it's really difficult to get so quickly by another method. So we're still in this idea of acceleration of inclusion and diversity through uh, visuals. Next photograph, I think, speaks for itself. Here we have a lady in a very Western um, setting because this exercise was at a business school in Lausanne, Switzerland. She is obviously not Western European. But not only is she not Western European, but she also had a problem, I think it was with her hip. So she couldn't be on the floor like all the other, all the other participants. So it's, it's an example of diversity and inclusion in itself. But more than that, if you look at um, the, the expressions on the faces, everybody is so focused, is so absorbed uh, in what they're doing. It's almost like a child at play. And it's a question of sort of being capable of being there in the moment, a question of mindfulness. And when we debrief on these exercises, because we always do a debrief, we ask the uh, participants, so did you think about using your iPhone? You know, how many emails you received? What about the meeting you were supposed to schedule? Did you think about any of those? And they'll go, uh, no. So how important would it be? How useful would it be to be able to have people who are that concentrated on one task in a society where multitasking has been proved not to be efficient? Last fun image 
uh, from one of my experiences. It's one of my favorite exercises. It's called cross portraits. So the way it works is you sit people down in two rows facing each other and you say, we're going to do some portraits. And then it's a totally inclusive uh, reaction because everybody starts to say to the partner across from them, you know, I, I, I'm really sorry, I, before we even start, I apologize because I, I, I don't draw, I know I'm going to make a mess of this, but you know, I'll do my best, so uh, just bear with me, sort of thing. Then we start, we give them 15 seconds, do a first um, drawing, and then they discover that in fact the exercise consists of moving the papers around so that in fact one portrait has been worked on by the number of participants involved. So everybody is included from the beginning because everybody is in the same degree of out of their comfort zone. And what was interesting with this exercise is that they're totally absorbed. But on the debrief, you know, what were your learnings kind of thing? It was, you know, we don't look at people anymore. And when you're drawing somebody's portrait, you have to look at that person, see what their eyes are like, what color they are, uh, whether they have curly hair or whatever. So it was learning to look at people again before we started to use screens or emails to people in the same office. They also noticed that they were listening differently because they were taking time to look at people. And now, I'm sorry that we haven't got Clyde yet, but we do have a very famous um, participant. I'm sure you recognize him. This is Mr. Einstein. Mr. Einstein was famous for various quotes. He has his left brain, which is linear, which is uh, whole, which is rational, which uh, is slow because it has to follow a process. And he has a right brain, which is nonlinear, which is based on images, which sees the big picture and which is very fast. We need both. And as Einstein said, and I quote, if I can't draw it, I can't understand it. Now, that seems like rather a lot uh, of information uh, at one time, and we're concerned that you might be on information overload. So, Flydet was going to propose a little exercise for you, which is just to look at the pictures I'm going to show you and think about how they resonate with you, what kind of emotions they bring up for you. And so, here we go. Just sit back, enjoy the pictures and see what they resonate, how they resonate with you. So there we go. Now, when we ran through this with Clydette, she asked me how I felt about these different um, pictures and drawings. And I noticed how different they were. And I noticed the different emotions that were brought up by the different images. For example, in the last image of the children, that was really, it makes me smile, it makes me feel happy because the colors are so joyous, because as one's standing on their head, they're having a great time. 
Um, the images, if you remember with the arrows coming in, I felt just, mm, a little bit aggressed by that, but very distinctly sort of almost fear. And then um, on, a more post, on a more personal note, the little bridge going into the forest in autumn actually reminded me of where my father is buried. So sadness and so on. So just to show that whatever the image, whether it's hand drawn, whether it's the photo, whether it's the video, it's going to connect on a totally different level from words alone. And this is the conclusion is that visuals elicit emotions and emotions elicit connections. This is the power of visuals to accelerate inclusion as we've been talking about up to now. So it looks like we've covered uh, our three main points. And just to sort of corroborate that and, and build a little bit on that, um, having a, a quotation from Marshall Rosenberg. Marshall Rosenberg um, was very famous in the 1960s, 70s. He wrote a lot about non-violent communication. And he said that words could be walls or windows. For Planet and for me, images are always windows. They always open windows, sometimes of opportunity, but just windows, they open conversations. And maybe just a little test, put that to the test. If I show you this list, maybe you're wondering what it is. The left brain goes right into action and goes, oh, different fonts, ah, words repeated. Um, I wonder what that is. If I show you the second part, okay, everybody goes, oh, but of course, it's a pizza. How much faster is it to see the pizza than to have to identify what this possibly could be in a linear, slow way? In the same way, if you take just some ordinary words, most people are familiar with those if you're speaking English. If you take the images, it will be a lot quicker. Just like in the book, uh, Icons for Travelers. But then, if you do a whole brain approach, which means that you take the words and the images, this is what you get. And there, the communication is instantaneous. It's this idea that if you use your left brain and your right brain, you're going to get to where you want to go much faster. In fact, we have some data for you on that. I'm just going to put them up and speak for themselves. If you're using social media or any kind of marketing material, think about this one. In terms of inclusion, visual learners are 65% across culture. So the acceleration that you're going to get by using the visuals is amazing. You will get people on the same page much faster with visuals and you'll get to agreement much faster than having just text, which takes time to get through and can be irritating because words tend to be legal jargon. They tend to close conversations rather than open them. And we have another famous guest after that, who is uh, Le Corbusier. I don't actually have the slide with me uh, at the moment, but Le Corbusier said that for him, drawing was much faster than writing in words. And that when you draw, you don't tell as many lies. So that is a really interesting point because you can't hide your feelings when you're drawing, unless you're a trained artist, you know, and you've done 15 years, Beaux-Arts and so on and so forth. If you're coming from where most people are, that's to say you stopped drawing at age eight, then it's really difficult to hide what you feel when you're drawing, as opposed to when you're writing, which you've mastered. This is a picture from Clydette, one of her coaching clients. On this side, 
you can see how her coaching client felt. Despite the fact that he was successful in his job, this is how he felt in relation to his manager. And this is how the coaching client drew the relationship. And it was when he drew the relationship that he realized that despite his success, he felt small and inconsequential and overborne by the manager. So Clyde asked him to draw what he would like to see. So you can see two people of the same size, smiling, and they're shaking hands. And apparently, a few weeks down the line, that actually happened, that he went into his boss's office and they did shake hands. So it's a really good story, and it's a really good example of how visuals can accelerate learning and for, for anybody. This is a story of one of my coaching clients. I uh, did this rather nice drawing. He saw himself as the little boat in the middle. That's to say, very small, small sailing boat in a very rough sea. The context was he had just been promoted and he was sent to headquarters. So headquarters, a lot of people, a lot of politics. And he imagined himself, we built this metaphor together that he was this tiny sailing boat and there were lots of very, very big and threatening boats around him. Two advantages of drawing in that situation were that instead of giving names to the people um, he was surrounded by, by using a sort of naval metaphor, we were able to build a strategy which gave us a perspective and took out the fear or the threat that he was feeling at the time. We could just concentrate on building the strategy. The other enormous advantage is that in a coaching situation, when you can draw with your client, then the bond that you get between coach and coachee is enormous and accelerated. These drawings are perhaps not bad. You think, oh, he was a good artist. Actually, he wasn't uh, at all. And as I may already have said, you don't need to be an artist to do the kind of drawing we're asking you to do. As I said, art was the only exam I ever failed, but remember this. The person who says, I can't draw, is actually saying, I'm scared, I feel threatened about drawing, but this lady is saying, I don't believe you, you can draw. Everybody can draw. And just to show you how easy it is to start, Let's look at some basic shapes. If you can draw these basic shapes, so squares, circles, ellipses, and if you can draw nice arrows, which is really not difficult, then you can also draw houses, signs, and you can draw signs, or you can draw banners, which say, I can draw, and of course, the better it is, then the quicker it goes. And now we'd like to invite you to take your piece of paper and take 20 seconds to draw a couple of houses. Any houses that you feel like doing. Don't think about it. Just go for it with your pencil or marker. Give you, give you 15 more seconds. And there we go. Clydette and I did this exercise, of course. We tried to walk a talk. These are Clydette's houses. I particularly like the rather wonky one on the left. These are my houses. And I was sort of coming from a diversity um, perspective. And I thought, what would it be like coming from a diverse cultural background? What would your house look like? You know, if you're an Eskimo, this is might, might look like. If you're a lighthouse keeper, then this is your house. Because the drawings are by necessity diverse and inclusive. If you say house, everybody knows what a house is. But when you have a whole lot of different houses, 
then you can open a window, you can start a conversation, and you're on a really safe topic for people to get to know each other and to interact. So we're coming to the end of our 30, 35 minutes. Just like to summarize by saying that, again, visuals are universal language, they engage the whole brain, and they allow people to create emotional connections. And remember, everybody can draw. And one thing we can't underline enough is that you need to have fun. This is one guy who was having great fun in the he exercise with the painting, and he actually started to press his green painted hand on the backs of other people. And they thought this was hilarious, so they started to do the same. And it was like being in a child's playground because the energy was really high, but the connection and the story that people could tell of that retreat afterwards was like way more exciting than if they'd just done pie charts and PowerPoint presentations. So remember that with Dan Rome, when you draw, you smile. And smiling people think better. Thank you. And we'd like to take any questions that you would be good enough to give us. Thank you very much for attending. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. I, I really want to smile. <laughs> and I really want to uh, find very quickly a, a new opportunities so we could work together and, and, and be involved in some uh, you know, drawings. Uh, thank you so much. This is very uh, inspiring and very... Uh, yeah, the, the, the connection that you're able to make uh, in a very simple way between visuals and inclusion mm -hmm. and recognizing that, uh, you know, uh, it does increase also the emotional connection. This yeah. is absolutely what uh, we, uh, we, are, we are promoting. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Now, mm -hmm. I have to say that I was able to connect with uh, Clydette okay. and she is so, so frustrated because suddenly the whole computer crashed oh, no. together with the internet. So we were trying to find a way to ensure that she could uh, you know, participate or contribute and we found a way. So what we are suggesting is that you and Clydette, you are putting together a video together, you're creating a, 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 a clip uh, yeah. to also hear the stories of Clydette and we will make sure that we will add this clip into the webinar. So we'll have a full uh, webinar to include her. So she's really sorry. She was so you know, excited about uh, you know, being with us and sharing her perspective. So, yeah. but that's things, you know, that, that's, it happens. That's, that's Thank you for the offer. Well, we will do that for sure. And I think we have some questions, Laura. Maybe, yeah, uh, one of the questions that came through was um, how do you actually get how do you actually convince clients to do these seminars in the first place? That, that's an excellent question. And uh, quite honestly, it's not easy. Because as in any other, I'm sure that Isabel has that um, challenge uh, just with the diversity and inclusion. But if you can do a demonstration for them, the best way is probably to offer, to say, look, no, um, no obligation, but I will come in and let's have a coaching conversation. Just let me give you a demonstration of how this can work. Because since it is visual and we, we all like to walk the talk, then it, it's necessary to show them rather than talk about it in words because words are left brain and visuals are right brain. Okay. But normally once they've had the experience, and then, the, then what happens, with, as with most consultants, is that by word of mouth, people will say, you know, this is what we did and these are the results that we got, and you can then refer back to previous clients. But I must admit, it's not easy. Mm. Another question that we got was, um, do you think there's, there's maybe a link between the visuals it themselves separately and then storytelling as a whole? That's an excellent question. Um, yes, because 
as we were saying, the best way to communicate with people is to have the left brain in the words and the right brain in the images. So we didn't really have time to talk about this because to me this is a, a, a whole new domain which you could also do a video uh, about the storytelling because that's also inclusive. Storytelling is a universal activity. Uh, whether you're in a society which doesn't actually write down the stories but still has an oral tradition or whether you're fairy tales or whether you're graphic or novels, whatever, then every civilization tells stories. And if you can do illustrations with the stories, then they're much more powerful and <laughs> they're much quicker. It's why people, when they're doing films, when they're movie making, they always do story wars before they can actually um, start to, to do the film. It takes away a lot of the work before you start. Mm -hmm. Another, thank you, Elizabeth. Another question that is coming through um, one of our participants is how do you actually work with disabled participants, specifically those that are visually impaired? Um, I haven't any specific um, experience of that. And it's something I, would, I haven't really gone into. But thank you to whoever asked that question because it's a really important point. And if that person, the person who asked the question, would like to contact me and have a discussion about that, uh, I'd like to see if we could be innovative and creative about that. Maybe there's something we could do around sound. Maybe because what happens when you have sound, if you're visually impaired, sound, of course, uh, will produce images in your brain, not images that you can sort of see on a piece of paper or on the screen, but will produce experience and images in your brain, which you can then express with other people. So there may be some way around music or, or, or back to storytelling, where the people can talk about the images. And maybe you could have somebody talking about an image that they can't physically see and have somebody who doesn't have visual impairment draw what they see and then feed it back to that person. There could be that kind of interaction between visually impaired and non-visually impaired. Mm. Thank you, Elizabeth. And actually, if, if you don't mind, I'll give an example of some work that we have done with um, a visually impaired person. And he actually had to give a presentation to a panel to get a promotion. And so he came to us because he wanted to prepare the presentation and he was um, also competing with other people to get the promotion. Um, so he came to us with the challenge of, I need to do a presentation. It needs to be 30 minutes. Help me, I don't know what to do. Um, so he, he was blind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, he said, I said, okay, and how, how do you think we could help you? And he said, well, I've got, um, I can search through the internet, but that takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something you can do to get my sources. So we did that. But what we did to begin with was just say to him, okay, tell us about, you know, what is your opinion about the subject that you need to present? Tell us the story that you want us to tell. Yeah. yeah. Um, how would you structure it? You know, what kind of facts do you think we could get? And so slowly we sort of put together like a panel, a structure of what his presentation would be. Mm -hmm. Then we went on to do a search on the internet and on books on each of the sections of the presentation. And we ended up with um, a text, a document. And this person is an, an incredible and he's got such a willpower. And what he did is with this story that we had created together, he learned it all by heart. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so he was happy about that, but he was very conscious that other people, other contenders to the same promotion would be showing visuals, PowerPoint, to, 
to the panel, yeah? So he said to us, please make me a PowerPoint. And we challenged him and said, you're different. You shouldn't just, you, you can't just go in there and show visuals that you cannot see. Absolutely. You haven't created them, you cannot see them. So what we did actually was to um, create panels out of wood with um, circles and with letters that were out of wood and had some millimeters so that he could touch them. So what he actually did was all the story that we had created, we put into panels, wooden panels, and some were made of cork and some were made of wood and some were made of different types of um, material. So they had a different texture. And he told his story and each time that he changed a, from one paragraph to the other of the story, he changed the panel himself. He changed the panel. We, we had put numbers on the panel and he was able to touch and to talk to the visuals that were stuck with wood on each panel. And that is how he made his presentation to the people, actually meeting them halfway, yeah? So through his story and through some visuals for them, just a, just a, a case study. That's a fantastic story. And it would be very helpful for him. I don't know if he got the job, but I could see a new job. He got the promotion. He got the promotion. So we were very happy about that. That's fantastic. And I might even go further than that because I work quite a lot with people wanting to do presentations. And I have nothing against PowerPoint. At all. But there are so many PowerPoints that are just sort of Excel spreadsheets or words, 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 words. The people are, ooh, you know, and they're falling asleep. So the fact that he was challenged actually made it more interesting. And the fact he was different probably made him better for that position. And people have spent hours and hours doing animation on PowerPoint without thinking about what was their real message. Because the PowerPoint is not the message. And the fact that you can do that is also showing creativity. I mean, obviously, you helped him an awful lot, but he was there on the day doing it. You know, so the courage that, that took, the qualities that that showed, I'm sure was what got him the, the recommendation and got him the mm. I have time for a last question, maybe just one last question. Yes, one there's two, one last question, Elizabeth, and it is, um, what happens if the collective drawing that you have worked on with the team or the group of participants ends up being ugly? <laughs> what, what if aesthetically the, the, the image looks ugly? What, what are the lessons that you can take out of it? There is no aesthetic judgment. The right brain does not judge. We're, we're not in any competition, we're not in any artistic. That's a fabulous question because it just allows me to get this sort of bee in my bonnet uh, out. It's, it's not a question of we're not competing in any competition. It's not academic. We're not going to be at the Basel uh, art fair, you know, like next year. Or maybe, if it's really ugly, possibly, you know. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is that people do things together. And what we encourage them to do is not to make, you know, for example, the portraits. We encourage them to do a gallery walk and they look at the portraits and we encourage them only to make positive comments. Because the important thing is that they did it together. And I've never had anything ugly. You know, and a lot of people either use, well, if it's 20 meters long, it's a little bit uh, difficult to move around. You can take photos and they do things like mouse maps or they use it for their internal communication because it was done by the people. What's important, is, it's like if you have children and they come home with a, um, a drawing of mummy, <laughs> you don't actually recognize mummy and say, oh, that's no, oh, good, that's mummy. What do you say to that child? You say, this is fantastic. You know, well done. And this is the, this is the kind of atmosphere we would like to build to visuals. So, 
People may think it's ugly because that is a very, very subjective thing to do. That's not the point. And we make that very clear before we even start that that's, there's no competition in this and that's not the point. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the same way as, uh, you know, when we are starting uh, any workshop or important me meetings, we are offering some principles for an inclusive dialogue. I think you are also offering some principles to make sure that people understand that it's not a, a competition, it's not, a, and as you said, you don't need to be an artist just to draw, just to express, it's another form of expression. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing your, your passion, and thank you also, Clydette, because I know that both of you have prepared mm -hmm. this presentation, and as I said, we will really, really ensure that we're creating a, a separate uh, you know, video clip that we could add into this webinar recording. So uh, everybody who is uh, you know, willing to uh, learn a little bit more could, uh, could see. I think one of the comments was, can we also see one of, uh, one of Clydette's uh, drawings? So we'll make sure that we will add some drawings. You, ha you have one, yes. You, you show the, the, the houses. We, we can't hear you, Elizabeth. <laughs> you just removed. You see the pictures of her houses. Yes, and indeed. The, boy, the, the man feeling very small, and then the man shaking hands. That's that's right. Yes. So it's nearly uh, three thirty. So we are, you know, we are going to uh, to to close the um, this webinar. Really fascinating, uh, you know, deep dive into the the connection between visuals and inclusion, and how we could uh, leverage this uh, tool of, uh, you know, drawings and using images to, uh, to connect at a different level, as you said, at a universal level. So it's uh, fantastic. So thank you everyone thank uh, you. for your participation. And thank you, Laura, for uh, leading the, the, the webinar series for 2018. So some news uh, in the next uh, few, few weeks with the dates of all our uh, uh, webinars and uh, as you said if you have uh, any topics that are of interest uh, you know you can also contact contact us you can follow up on our uh, Facebook uh, Pluribus News or Twitter I mean connect with us this is really about um, getting connections uh, having conversations and you know brainstorming together I mean we all have a common passion, which is to build more inclusion in the world. Um, yeah, we, we have a big vision, <laughs> but also in our, you know, in our teams, in our, in our organizations. And we really believe that, uh, you know, we can, we can play a, a positive role. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Elizabeth. And, um, you know, Clydette was certainly we with us like in spirit. Absolutely. So I'm going to close the, um, the, the the webinar thank you everyone wherever you are in the world thank, thank you. you bye 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 everyone